Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome back to the 22nd Annual Family Cafe. This is the afternoon session here on our Thursday. Uh, you probably know me by now if you've been watching these. I'm Jeremy Countryman. I'm the program director here at the Family Cafe. You also might notice that I am not in front of our fancy backdrop. Instead, I am right around the corner in my office. And the reason for that is that we actually have our speakers here in our office today. We're doing our best to stay safe. So we've got everybody in their own room with their computers and their PowerPoints. And one of our presenters I can see is not here in the building, two of them are. So uh, as we mentioned earlier, uh, when we closed out this morning, we're focusing on behavioral health today on our Thursday. And uh, this afternoon session, we're gonna hear from three of the state agencies that are really critical in shaping the behavioral health system of care for children, youth, and young adults. A lot of times, you know, we get questions from people out there in communities across the state. They have a child or a youth in their family that has a behavioral health issue. They want to know how to access the system, what resources are available. And hopefully this presentation is going to answer some of those questions for you. Now, speaking of questions, uh, as always, we're hoping to get questions and comments from everybody viewing this. So there is a comment thread there on Facebook Live. Go ahead and put your questions and comments in there. We'll collect those as we go along. And we're certainly going to leave a little bit of time towards the end of the hour to get to some of those questions as part of the live broadcast. So we're really fortunate today. We have three agencies represented. We have uh, Kristen Karinko from APD, uh, Alexandria Lloyd from ACA, the Agency for Healthcare Administration. And we have Mary Schrenker, our friend from DCF and their Office of Substance Abuse and Mental Health. So welcome to all of you. And with that, I'll go ahead and hand it over to Mary. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. And thanks for joining us. We're gonna be talking about Florida's behavioral health system of care for, youth, for children, youth, and young adults. And first up is gonna be Kristen Korienko. She's with the Agency for Persons with Disabilities. Hey, thank you, Mary. All right, well, uh, we have a, Oh no, we don't want to pause that. Okay, technology is a beautiful thing as long as it works. <laughs> so let me let me see what's going on here. Resume share. Okay, you should see the PowerPoint presentation that has our logo APD in the top right hand corner. I want to thank both Mary and Alexa for extending this opportunity for the three main agencies that help. Uh, to shape and carve out the services and supports that are so needed in the state of Florida for all of our children and young adults. Uh, I've had the privilege of working alongside Mary on a couple of task forces and uh, really feel the connection and the camaraderie uh, with regard to really trying to bust silos and come together in order to provide the services and supports. So today we're going to give you an overview of how you can link up and access the pieces of information and resources for you or your family to gain, or gain access to those services. So the first thing I wanna do is just give you an overview of how the presentation is going to go which um, I will be obviously speaking first for APD, and then Alexa will be talking a little bit about um, uh, ACA's role, and uh, Mary will be talking about DCF and SAM, SAMHSA. We have some additional resources that we're just giving to you as an example. Um, in my work, I've talked with a lot of different families, and for that, I'm grateful. Uh, I'm always appreciative of the fact an experience that we, we have working with the families and the opportunities that you as parents give us to serve your child. So thank you for that. Uh, also want to just let you know, please feel free to ask us anything. Uh, if we can't sufficiently address it here during the presentation, we'll be more than happy to take it back and go ahead and formulate some responses for you and give you some direction. So, so the, go ahead. Did you want me to do that one? Yes. So, oh. <laughs> sorry. So this no, is, I, I just want to say this is a little weird for me because I'm not used to sitting still in a chair. 
<laughs> I'm used to moving around when I'm doing a presentation. So hopefully this will be all right. Um, so we wanted to just kind of give an overview before we start getting in a little deeper into the behavioral health system of care. It includes mental health and substance use services and supports that are in a variety of community-based and residential settings. And while we just have three agencies represented here, we're not the only ones who, who pay for services for children, youth, and young adults. There's private insurance, local, state, and federal funds, Medicaid, Florida Healthy Kids, Kids, and Kids, which is Kids Care. There's also sometimes you've got um, children's services boards as a local area, county government. So there's a lot of different sources for funding. And in, in addition to the three agencies that are represented here, there's also the Department of Education provides some behavioral health services, Children's um, Department of Health, Children's Medical Services, Department of Juvenile Justice, and the Department of Corrections. Okay. A little bit about APD or the Agency for Persons with Disabilities. And when, when the three of us, when Mary, Alexa, and I were, were uh, planning our presentation, in light of how we were presenting this information to you, not face-to-face -face in a big uh, room at a, at a conference or, or a conference venue, we decided that the best takeaway would be to give you a set of PowerPoints that actually had the links to the information in them. So the first piece of information is our mission. And our mission is critical, obviously. We take it very seriously. We want to increase access to community-based services, treatment, and residential options. Uh, we also want to increase the number of people with intellectual and developmental disabilities in the workforce. And we also look at our own internal structures and we want to improve the management, not only of the agency, but also the oversight and the education and provider development of those folks that serve you as service providers. In order for you to get to the website so that you can see exactly how to go about accessing and applying for services, the link is here. And what you'll do is this is all of the information that you need to know with regard to how to go about applying for services. It shows the actual disabilities that uh, are qualifying or eligible disabilities for those services. It also has links. I'm not gonna read all of this to you, but uh, this is the actual page. And if you scroll down, you'll see additional links for other information. One of the programs that Mary had referred to is Florida Kid Care. The link is there as well. And I think that that's a real important piece of information to, to highlight too, is all of our websites kind of commingle with links. So it's a very good, uh, there's a very good possibility that if you can't find it on one of our websites, it will be on another one of our websites uh, for your information. If you scroll down, there's some FAQs, frequently asked questions. Um, if you're applying because you want to move to Florida, let's say you, you are deciding to make, make the commitment to, to relocate, we love our state um, and uh, we would love for you to be a part of it. This is all of the information that you need to know in order to go ahead and start the ball rolling with application for services. Also has information on a specific syndrome that is uh, not new to the medical community, but fairly new to um, developmental disability eligibility world is Phelan McDermott syndrome. Information on active, active duty military service families. And there's also uh, links here for you to apply uh, in English and in Spanish. And I believe that that's Creole. In the event you don't know specifically uh, how to go about contacting your regional office, there is a map and you can click on that map anywhere. Let's say you wanna to go to Orlando 
if you click, there's Jeanette Estes. She's, she's wonderful. She's an awesome uh, prom. This is a how our, this is where all of the uh, staff are located and under, under which field office the county of choice is, is how. Looks like it's back up. Okay, testing one, two, three. Yeah. All right. Um, I, I had just uh, switched over from the resources for families to the actual APT page that shows you the COVID information. We have general information. We also have provider information, but on both of these links, there is a copious amount of information for you to peruse through. At, at your leisure and access what you feel you and your family need at this time. Um, there's everything from uh, basic infection control all the way up to and including what are some of the things that are going on not only in Florida but also around the country and furthermore around the world with how families are dealing with these particular issues with their children. Um, how do you teach social distancing? Uh, how do you uh, demonstrate and role model hand washing and perhaps looking at a social story so that it tries, it, it, this particular uh, intervention would help to calm the fears, uh, perhaps not only in your child, but also um, it will help you as well. So there is a, a, a lot of information here and it's all available to you for free. There's also the links for the CDC guidelines as well as up-to-date current information. The nice thing that our communications department, well, they do a, a lot of wonderful things, but one of the things that's, that's really um, helpful is each time you come back to the page, if there's something that's brand spanking new that you haven't seen, it's located there and the most current is on top. So if you just go to that section and click there's a lot of information and you will be given access to the most current uh, up-to-date information so that you know what to expect. Okay. All right. Um, I just wanna go ahead and sing the praises of this particular uh, resource as well, uh, which if you know me, you know I'm a diehard Florida State fan. So for me to do anything that's, that says I'm, I'm supportive of something that was published by University of Miami, you know it's gotta be pretty good, okay? But this particular book, and it's very, very short, it's only about 40 pages long, has a lot of different practical information and guidelines and step-by-step -step instructions as to what you can do to help your child uh, through the COVID-19 pandemic. And um, with that, I believe that it is now time to kind of shift gears. Uh, the last point that I have on here, and uh, it has to do with what a dual diagnosis is. Um, you might have heard a dual diagnosis is mental illness and substance abuse. And that is true. That is one particular facet of, of a, a dual diagnosis. However, we also see folks within our population who not only have an intellectual and developmental disability, but they also have a mental, psychiatric, or psychological diagnosis. Uh, there is a national association that also has a variety of different resources. If you go to that, it's called NAD. Um, there is a lot of information. I'm a proud member of, of NAD, and uh, there's a wealth of information here for you to just peruse through and uh, ask questions. Uh, I'm, I'm Dr. Fletcher, who is the founding member of NAD, is a wonderful resource, is nearing retirement, uh, but he doesn't mince words. He will respond very, very quickly. And uh, that is just another, another resource for you to reach out to and, and, and 
ask your questions. And I believe that since we're moving over into the mental health aspect now, that now I'm going to go ahead and tag in Mary or is it Mary or Alexa? Mary. Okay, so Mary, let me pull yours up. Okay, and away we go. Okay, thanks, Kristen. Okay. Hi again, everybody. I'm Mary Schranker with the Department of Children and Families with the Office of Substance Abuse and Mental Health. I'm really glad to be here, and hopefully we won't have any more technical difficulties, but if we do, we have a master who is going to help us get through that. <laughs> So I wanted to talk a little bit about our target populations and how the Department of Children and Families Substance Abuse and Mental Health is set up. The target populations for our services are defined in statute. They might be defined by the legislature for a special project, or they're defined by a federal grant that we've been awarded that says this is who you're going to serve with that grant money. We contract with seven managing entities across the state, and they manage the day-to-day -day operational delivery of the behavioral health services for individuals with no insurance or who are what we called underinsured. And that means someone who actually has insurance, but they need some behavioral health services that their insurance doesn't cover. The managing entities contract with a variety of behavioral health providers and they're delivering services for prevention, treatment, and recovery within the, the contracted geographical area that they serve. For more information about that, you can visit our website and we are gonna go, Kristen's gonna help us go dive through our website towards the end of this. Next slide, please. Okay. So here's who is defined in statute that we serve. Um, Again, they have to have no insurance or be underinsured. We serve children that have serious emotional disturbances, emotional disturbances, or who are at risk of developing an emotional disturbance. We serve adults with serious mental illness, including those that have forensic involvement, which is court involvement. That's the individuals who've been found not guilty by reason of insanity. We serve persons in crisis and persons that have a co-occurring mental illness and substance use disorder, persons with or at risk of developing substance use disorders. And of course, we also serve, we also might be serving some persons who have intellectual or developmental disabilities and are duly diagnosed with either a mental illness or a substance use disorder. Next slide, please. Come on. Okay, there we go. <laughs> so this is kind of the array of behavioral health services that are available. And this is not just for our population that we serve, but this covers services provided, some of them by Medicaid providers, and they may be services that persons on the Agency for Persons with Disabilities waiver may be able to access. So there's, there's a little bit of difference when you're talking between adult and children and a little bit of difference between substance use services and mental health services. So in the mental health realm, whether it's child or adult, the kind of bottom part is health promotion. We want everybody to be able to be healthy. Um, and in substance use, it's prevention. So services targeted to youth to try to prevent them from engaging in using substances. The next step up to actual services is outpatient. So that outpatient service might be counseling in an office. It might be someone coming to their home to provide counseling and case management. It might be happening at a school. So the different kinds of outpatient services include medication management, but it's all provided within a community setting. We also have been working very hard for the last few years on developing community support and peer support. So I probably a lot of y'all can appreciate that when you've got something going on, it's helpful to talk to someone who have had a similar experience who might be able to give you some suggestions, if nothing else, just listen to you, maybe help you try to navigate how you can find help for your child. And so we've been working really hard on that in the adult world. And then in the last year and a half or so, we've also been trying to promote that for children and families. 
The next step up in the continuum of services for adult mental health is crisis stabilization unit, short-term residential treatment or inpatient. So now we've moved into you're not in your home anymore. Adult substance use, we have residential and we have detoxification, which is also an inpatient type program. In the children's world for mental health, the therapeutic placements range from therapeutic foster homes, therapeutic group homes and residential treatment centers. And then children's substance use is, is the same as adult with residential and detoxification. The highest level for adults mental health is the state treatment facilities. Those are our state hospitals. And for substance use, it's an addictions receiving facility. And for children's mental health, it's the crisis stabilization unit or inpatient. So that's kind of the array of services that is available out there. And a lot of them are the same regardless of the funding source. Next slide, please. I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the key initiatives that we have that's really on focused on family focused care. We have been working for the last quite a few years on infusing our system with what we call systems of care principles, which says it's very much family driven and youth guided. It says you're the expert in what your child needs. And then how can we help you get that? and very much trying to involve everyone that's involved in that child's life because there may be multiple agencies and things. Most kids are going to school. Um, young adults may be having, they may be working or trying to work. So some of these, these services are all really trying to look at what, what, what does the family want and develop plans that really focus on how can we help you get better. So we have what's called a community action treatment team that's also commonly called CAT. And it, unlike my cats, it doesn't meow and scratch me. These are nice people. It's a team-based, family-focused, community-based services and support for young people that are 11 to 21 and have significant behavioral health needs. And many times they're multi-agency involved. They may have involvement with the Department of Juvenile Justice. This program is available statewide, and the goal is to help these youth remain with their families and connected to their community. We have what's called Family Intensive Treatment, or FIT, and this is a service that's not available statewide. We have 23 providers. It's also team-based family focused comprehensive services. For this program, there has to be a, a open child welfare involvement, meaning that there's been an abuse report and that one of the issues is parental <laughs> substance use. And there has to be a child who's 10 or younger. So the goal with this family is to provide some really intensive services to increase parental pr protective capacity, <laughs> increase child safety, and decrease the parental substance use and child reabuse and neglect. Next slide, please. We have mobile response teams, and this is a service that has been available statewide for a little over a year. Uh, we did have it in some areas, but not completely statewide until last year. It's on-demand crisis intervention services. So the any setting, it can be in the school, it can be in the home, it can be out at a park for individuals that are up to age 25. So what happens when you call a mobile response team is there's gonna take some information and make a decision about whether the situation requires someone to respond face-to-face. Right now, a lot of some of that is being done by telehealth. Some of the teams are still going out. Sometimes they're making a decision before they go out by talking with the family, asking questions about, have they been exposed? Is anybody sick? Anybody coughing? Anybody have a fever in the home? And that might make them say, you know, we really just need to do this through telehealth and not come out. But what they're trying to do, what the whole purpose is, is to try to prevent unnecessary psychiatric hospitalizations and divert from these emergency departments and juvenile or criminal justice, lessen trauma for individuals. So they're trying to de-escalate that situation. And then they stay involved for up to 72 hours to make sure that the person gets linked into services. 
So that is available statewide. And if it's if the team decides that it requires a face-to-face -face contact, that's that happens within 60 minutes. We also have a program for pregnant women and women with dependent children who are using substances and want to stop. The, this is not a statewide program, but we have services that are available, include residential treatment, outpatient treatment, detoxification, childcare, case management. Where appropriate, the family is treated as a unit. So in some of our residential facilities, they have the capability of allowing the mom to have the baby with her while she's receiving substance use services or the young children with her. And even though this isn't a statewide program, our providers are required to give pregnant women seeking substance use services priority. Next slide, please. And the final team that I wanna talk about is the Florida Assertive Community Treatment Team or FACT. So this is also not available statewide. There's 33 teams. This is for 18, for age 18 and older. So this is for specifically for adults and they provide 24 hour multidisciplinary approach for comprehensive care for adults with serious mental illness. And it's, it's they provide services where they work, go to school if they're going to school, where they spend, spend their leisure time, where they live and they are providing the majority of the behavioral health treatment, rehabilitation and support services to these individuals with a goal of trying to help them remain in the community and achieve their recovery goals. So they can help them with housing, they help them apply for SSI if they have not already done that. In some cases, this is being used as a step down from the state hospitals. In other cases, they're trying to really keep that person in the community so that they don't have to go to the state hospital. Next slide, please. So now here's where Kristen is gonna help me <laughs> show you how to navigate the uh, DCF website. Okay. So, and I did put it into the PowerPoint. Oh, good deal, okay. Yes. All right. Okay, so, and then we'll we'll do a little backing up to show you how you actually get to this. But on this site, so if you get click home, so here, this is the DCF website. If you haven't been on it in a while, there's been a lot of updates to it. And of course, as with all state agencies website, we've got information about COVID-19 on there. So there's a lot of different things on here. There's news, there's upcoming public things and events. Not that we're having a whole lot of public events that aren't, that aren't held remotely, but if you click on services up at the top and then scroll down to substance abuse and mental health. So that gets to our part of the website. So if you scroll down a little bit, you will see four adults, four children. You went a little bit too far. Sorry. That's okay. Okay, okay so <laughs> four adults, four children, four providers. So remember way back in the beginning when I talked about managing entities, under the four providers, if you want some information about managing entities, like some boring contract documents and stuff, you can find that all there. Okay. And then to find immediate help, you can either click under find immediate help for children or adults, it doesn't matter, it takes you to the same place. And so if you click on that, you can find services by county. So if we'll get Kristen to put in her favorite county, it's Broward County. Well, it's my home. It, it it's just your home. home. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so under each county, you're going to see something very similar. You're first going to see your local provider of services, which is the managing entity for Broward. That's Broward Behavioral Health Coalition. And there's a phone number where you could call them. You'll find information about the community action treatment team, the CAT team. If there's a program for coordinated specialty care for early psychosis, that will be there. If there's a FACT team, that will be there. The mobile response, because that's statewide, that'll be on all of them and it'll give you the numbers. In this case, the Henderson Behavioral Health has a different line for adults and for youth. Mm -hmm. And then if there's a FIT team, then that will be there as well and you can get that information. So if I could get you to close that, 
and go back one, I'll show you, Kristen will show you. Um, if you scroll down, we're looking for maps. So okay. there we go. Yes. So we've got maps and you click more information and here you can find more information about each of the things that, that I, most of the things that I talked about. I didn't talk about the coordinated specialty care for early psychosis, um, but that's in there. And then you can click on the map. So then in this case, it's the CAT team map. And this will show you who are the providers statewide. And there's a phone number and it tells you which it's, it sometimes is a little hard, especially with the cat and the mobile response, because there's so many of them. It can be a little difficult to kind of interpret that. But the red number, so how this map works, the, the different colored sections show our, um, show where the managing entity's responsibility is. So the managing and the, what's broken out is our regions. So you can see there's some crossover in some of our regions with managing entities. And then the number 01, 14, 02, and so forth, that's the judicial circuit. And then that red number is what tells you for the CAT team. So for instance, if we say, let's say we're in Pasco County, number 29, then if you scroll down to find number 29, so that is Bay Care Behavioral Health. So that's who has the, it, who runs the CAT team for Pasco County. And so each of those Lutheran services is one of our managing entities, Central Florida Behavioral Health Network, Central Florida Cares. Those are our, our managing entities. So it's color coded by managing entity. So. Okay. And then there's different maps for the different programs. Okay, let me just Thanks. go back. I think there's I, a, was that it as far yeah. as the, okay. Oh, and there's God. a lot of other information on there. So yeah. if you, the, um, you know, if you have time to peruse, there's a lot of information available on our website. Right. And so this is information about each of the different teams. So if okay. we could go back to the PowerPoint. Thank okay. You All right. Um, so go one slide up. We skipped one. Okay. Oh, here we go. Okay. So the last thing that I wanted to let y'all know about is the department was awarded an emergency COVID-19 grant and implementation and planning is in process right now. We're hoping to have some things started in the, in July. What the grant is for is two things. One thing is for us to provide telehealth services for healthcare practitioners and individuals that have less serious mental illness that wouldn't necessarily typically meet our target population, but they need some emotional support as a result of the COVID-19 crisis. So we're gonna have one telehealth provider statewide this will be available that anyone would be able to call and receive some help excuse me and then we're going to be increasing funding for behavioral health services for our target population in the areas that have been most impacted by COVID-19 so the south part of the state the Jacksonville area that's some in central Florida um, so excuse me, not, I don't know if all of that has completely been worked out yet as far as how much money is going where, but we will be increasing behavioral health services for our target population with this emergency COVID grant. And that is the end of my stuff. There's right. my phone number, there's my email. <laughs> if you have any questions, if I don't know the answer, I will get back with you. I will, I will find out and get back with you. Thank you. All right. All right. So now we're going to go to Alexa. And uh, you tell, um, should I go ahead and pull up your, your, the, uh, the ACA page? Um, yeah, well, I can um, cue you like towards the end. Um, okay. At a specific point, you can pull up for me if you wouldn't mind. Sure. Not at all. Thank you. 
Okay, okay, great. So good afternoon. My name is Alexa Lloyd, and I'm a policy analyst in the behavioral health unit for the Agency for Healthcare Administration. And um, I have a couple of topics that I wanted to go over with you today. And um, the first is the organization of Florida Medicaid. So um, Florida Medicaid has two delivery systems. And uh, the majority of Medicaid recipients, about 80% of them, um, receive their benefits from the first delivery system, which is managed care. And essentially what managed care means is that the recipient receives coverage from a health plan, such as United Healthcare, Stay Well, Sunshine, any of those. And then um, the second delivery system is often referred to as straight Medicaid, um, but it's also the fee-for-service delivery system um, with about 20% of re Medicaid recipients being enrolled in that. Um, the second topic I wanted to go over with you all is the comprehensive array, array of services that are available um, for behavioral health, including telemedicine. So um, Florida Medicaid creates policies and procedures for several behavioral health services, such as um, community behavioral health services, specialized therapeutic services, um, statewide inpatient psychiatric programs for children, and also um, targeted case management for children and adults. Additionally, under the early and periodic screening diagnostic and treatment benefit, um, Florida Medicaid is required by federal law to cover services up to eligible recipients under the age of 21, um, if medically necessary, to treat a mental or a physical illness. Um, the agency also covers behavioral health telemedicine services. So the agency covers behavioral health evaluation, diagnostic, and treatment recommendation services through telemedicine. Um, the agency reimburses behavioral health assessment, medication management screening services through telemedicine at the same rate that's detailed on the community behavioral health fee schedule. Providers must perform all service components designated for the procedure code build. And additionally, all services must be, accord must be conducted in accordance with the agency's telemedicine rule. Um, speaking of telemedicine, that leads me to our next topic, which is the flexibilities that have been provided under the state of emergency. So um, the agency has expanded um, a services that are provided through telemedicine via live two-way communication through the fee-for-service delivery system to include treatment services as medically necessary. Some examples of these services include brief individual psychotherapy for mental health or for substance abuse, individual and family therapy, medication management and medication-assisted treatment. Um, the ACA public website has a page dedicated to all of these provider alerts. Uh, that are related to the flexibilities allowed under the state of emergency. And I think Kristen's gonna help me with, out with that later in our next section, but um, stay tuned, I will show you. Okay. Um, <laughs> um, this, this leads me to my last topic, which is resources. So um, for assistance, for on the recipient side, um, for assistance with managed care related issues, um, we encourage you to contact your specific health plan. Um, but for assistance with fee-for-service or um, any just general Medicaid-related questions, uh, we do have a Medicaid helpline, and uh, the phone number for that helpline is 1-877-254-1055. And um, additionally, the ACA public website has many helpful resources for both recipients and also for providers as well. Um, the COVID-19 alerts page has the most probably current information on the website regarding services and flexibilities under the state of emergency. So Kristen, if you wouldn't mind pulling that up, that would be great. Okay. Ooh, let's see. Okay, Aka. There we go. Okay. Perfect. Okay. <laughs> Great. So if you go um, on this page, uh, this, this is always the most up-to-date page. Um, from here, you can access um, lots of different things, but most specifically, we do have all of our related alerts that have to do with, um, if you click on that Medicaid alerts, perfect. Thank you. Okay. Um, this is all of our most recent Medicaid alerts and they're uh, by category and they have all of the dates as well. Um, the highlights are listed in the bulleted points, but then the links to the exact alert are, are 
located next to it. So um, you can look at any of those if you're looking for a specific service to see if there's any flexibilities um, for that particular service. Okay. Great, thank you, Kristen. Okay. And then um, lastly, um, also on similarly on the ACA public website, uh, there is a managed care page as well um, that has many resources that are available. Um, so some of the resources include the health plans by region, if you're looking for a health plan. Um, it has Medicaid and plan contacts um, as well, a contact list for each of those. And then there's recipient support information. Um, also, there's a portal there where you can submit questions if you have questions about specific policies or aspects of a policy. And there's also a place where you can submit a complaint as well. And then there's also a place where you can sign up for program updates. So, um, yes, so that concludes my portion of the presentation. Thank you so much, Kristen, for your um, Vanna services. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. All right. Uh, we are at uh, 2.47, so we have reserved enough time for any questions that have come through uh, or additional information. Uh, so I, I guess, uh, do we tag in uh, Jeremy? Have you seen yeah, any Yeah, well, this is, hey, this is Joe. I, I've got a few questions, just a few. You guys did a great job, by the way. Thank you so much. Thank you. That was a lot of information. Thank you. Um, Thank and you. Uh, we do appreciate it. All right, so just a couple of questions here. Um, you know, you, you all talked about this a little bit. Is there anything else on the COVID-19, you know, has obviously changed the landscape. I appreciate, I appreciate you bringing up um, some of the specific things. Is, is there anything, you know, that you can add to it? I've had a few questions about it a little bit in terms of, um, you know, is, are we seeing a large increase in the demand for behavioral health services? Anything else you want to just add about that? So this is Mary Schranker. I could jump in on that. We've seen it's it's a little, some of the services, there's been an increase in demand and others there hasn't been as much of an increase. So for example, with our mobile response teams, we've seen a decrease in the calls for mobile response. And we think that has to do with the, the, a lot of the calls that were coming in were coming from schools. So once school shut down, then you know they weren't at school anymore. Possibly whatever was triggering them was at school. Or it's also possible that now that they're at home, maybe their families don't have any idea about the mobile response team services. So the mobile response teams have said that they are seeing an increase in calls in the age group of 18 to 35. So we've actually allowed them, even though the money was targeted for people 25 and under, we've allowed them to serve people who are older. And of course, if they go out and they find out the person is 26 or 27, even before COVID, they weren't going to say, oh, sorry, bye, have a nice life. They were still going to do what they could do to help that person. So we have seen, it's just kind of, and, and some of it varies from area to area as well. So our providers are really trying, it, it was, for some of our providers, and this is possibly the same for Medicaid providers and for APD providers, some of them were already poised to be able to start telehealth pretty quickly because they already had equipment, they were already doing it in some fashion. They might've been doing Medicaid management via telehealth for a while, um, and maybe not so much some of the counseling services, but they, they, were, they had, some, and then other providers hadn't done any of it. They'd never dipped their toe in telehealth. So they had a bigger learning curve. They had to get equipment for it. And so I think probably there's been some variance around the state in how quickly anybody could respond to anything. I know that some of our specialty programs like the CAT team runs a waiting list. They're still running a waiting list. So we're still, there's been, it just kind of, I guess, varies. There's not a really easy answer to that question, but I do appreciate the question. Mm -hmm. And I just to piggyback on that, I would agree. I think uh, navigating the changing contingencies and what that's going to do uh, moving forward so that we can capture what worked and what helped to provide services and supports for our folks, uh, especially in in areas that perhaps uh, may or may not be served as densely as some of the other areas in the state of Florida. 
So mm -hmm. there, there will be a lot of lessons learned at the conclusion of this. Yeah. And we really truly hope that just like everybody else, we are hoping that this resolves soon. Yes. And I do yeah. think that some of the challenges and particularly in more rural areas have been with the lack of internet. So hopefully, I don't know, I don't, I'm not an internet guru, so I don't really know exactly. <laughs> I can't claim to know how it works, but I'm glad it does. Um, but so some of our, some of the people that we're trying to serve really don't have much, they really don't have internet access. They didn't have any kind of, even if they had internet access, they didn't have an account. They didn't have a laptop or an iPad or some kind of a tablet. So a lot of the schools were getting those things and paying for internet for families, getting them the equipment so that the children could continue the distance learning. So I can't believe one of our lessons learned out of all this is that I think we already knew our internet service wasn't the same statewide, but would be, is there something that can be done that to um, get better internet service for everybody? Yeah. Well, I think the governor just signed a bill about that uh, yesterday, as a matter of fact. So uh -huh. <laughs> that's good news. Good. That's good yeah. news. Yes. Well, Mary, this one's really more for, for you. Okay. Um, uh, how do you determine if someone is at risk for developing emotional disturbances or at risk for developing a substance abuse problem? So that's a good that. question. That's, that's a good question. Um, the mental health, you could, can look at when we think of someone at risk of they're pro, there's someone who's having some difficulties. They might be having difficulties in school. Um, they might be having difficulties at home, but they've not yet gotten any kind of formal diagnosis. So that's kind of the at risk for, for the mental health. That it's someone who quite possibly has a diagnosis, they've just never been diagnosed. Or they're just displaying behaviors that suggest they might have some kind of a diagnosis. For substance use, the at risk, there's a whole um, survey that's done, a youth survey that's done every year on for high school students. I don't know if there's one for middle school or if it's just high school, but that asks a lot of questions on just attitudes about substance use and whether people have tried stuff. And it's, it's kind of alarming that year after year, there's quite an increase in the number of youth who are reporting, trying some stuff that seems, that seems like really pretty wild um, and how many different kinds of things that they have tried. So that the at risk of substance use disorders are gonna be those individuals who are experimenting, if you wanna call that. Um, that are kind of trying out stuff because there's a risk. Some of the some of the stuff that's out there, there's a risk of getting addicted the first time you use it or the second time because the high is so great and the low is so bad that you want to get back up to the high. Right. So I hope that answers the question. No, that's very thorough. That's great. I think, you know, just lastly, just to finish it up, I know something that we all talk about a lot, especially around here is youth and family peer supports. Mm -hmm. I know those are, you know, such an important part of this equation yes. here. Does anybody want to just talk about that a little bit and the importance of that and how, how y'all, how that gets coordinated? Mary, you want to take it first? Sure. Okay. Sure. So the Department of Children and Families has had a project for several years that we call for, I think like five, six years, that we call Recovery Oriented Sur Recovery Oriented System of Care or ROSC. Now this has been focused initially strictly on adult substance use individuals to, so we have people in all of our managing entities who are ROSC people who have worked on peer certification. The, we contract with the Florida Certification Board to certify people as peer specialists. And there's different levels of that. There's one for adults, there's one for veterans, for families, and for youth. So we have quite a number of adult peers out there. And what we've been working the last couple of years on is really increasing family peers and youth peers. 
that we're trying to get. Um, there's, they're required to get certified. You have to have a certain number of hours of training of going to of different trainings that, and there's a, a um, set of competencies that those trainings have to cover. And then you have to have a number of hours, 500 hours of actually providing peer support under someone's supervision. And then you have to pass a test. So it's not an easy thing to, to do all that, but there are a lot of people who have been committed to it and really wanted to, to, to become certified and have been able to do that. And we have some scholarships available to, because there's a fee for the individual with the floor certification board. Um, one, another thing, when you think about, particularly with substance use, people who might be interested in being a peer are probably someone who, ha who struggles with their own substance use disorder and who is in their own recovery. Mm -hmm. And that might mean that they might've gotten arrested they might have gone to jail. So there are some disqualifying offenses and we have, have worked in the last few years on trying to get some changes enacted into legislation that would allow us to make an exemption for peer support for people who are trying to get certified for peer support if they have some of these disqualifying offenses. And I don't know if it's been signed yet, but one of the bills that was passed through the legislature this year did allow us to give exemptions specifically to people who are trying to be certified for peer support. I know that's such an issue in so many areas in the substance abuse world uh, where people's experiences have been, yeah, unfortunately. And you think about like, that's the perfect person to try to help somebody. Exactly. They, you know, right. were at rock bottom, they were in jail and they mm -hmm. have pulled themselves out. And now they're, you know, they want to share that and help somebody else from becoming them. And yet they can't do it because they were in jail. So that's um, right. yeah, yep. that's right. So hopefully that, I don't know if that bill has been signed yet, but I know there's been a flurry of bill signing in the last week or so. So I don't know if that one was signed yet, but fingers crossed. Well, guys, we're about at the top of the hour. I really want to thank you all. That was so much information. And I think uh, we're going to find out people are going to watch this more than one time to be able to absorb as much information as you gave us. We really do appreciate it. Really substantive. And, uh, and thank you very much. Um, Jeremy, do you want to take it away to talk a little bit real quick about tomorrow and any housekeeping issues yeah. we have? Certainly. Uh, and, you know, before I do that, of course, I want to add my own thanks. Kristen, Mary, Alexandria, uh, you guys all did a fantastic job, and it is really important information. We're committed here at the Family Cafe to including mental health and behavioral health generally as um, something we want to address as part of our overall efforts to uh, serve people with all types of disabilities and special health care needs. So great content today. I uh, got more great content, of course, coming up tomorrow. Tomorrow is a big day. It's another, I'm going to go ahead and give it a special name, Joe. It is a Keynote really? Friday. Nice. Keynote Friday. We had Where in the Keynote world did you Friday come up with that, week. Jeremy? <laughs> I, you know, I come up with these things. Who knows? It's just, it's like magic happens. Yeah. <laughs> so our morning keynote. Tomorrow morning at 11 o'clock, we're going to have Bobby Silverstein. He's someone who is one of the architects of the American with Disabilities Act. Of course, 2020, it is the 30th anniversary of the ADA. So we thought it made sense to have somebody here to join us who was part of writing that legislation and was there when it was signed and has been working on disability rights issues from the policy side for many, many years. So definitely make sure to join us for that one. And then at two o'clock tomorrow afternoon, the Agency for Persons with Disabilities is gonna be here. It's time to meet Barbara Palmer, director of APD. Always a really popular session at our in-person annual family cafe. In fact, I remember last year, we um, got Barbara Palmer to move into the general session room and uh, get up there on the stage, even though it wasn't like a keynote type thing, just so we had a few more seats because people will always have a lot of questions about APD, how it works, how to access their services and stuff like that. So 
We hope you will definitely come back and join us for both of those sessions tomorrow. And then of course on Saturday, we're back again at 11 and two with two different round table sessions, one on autism, one on cerebral palsy, and then we're gonna be exhausted. So Joe will be taking Sunday off. <laughs> uh, also, before we sign off, I just wanna remind you, you know, visit us on Facebook. In addition to these live sessions, which we'd love for you to join us for when they're actually happening, we have recordings of all the sessions we've done up until this point. We're also posting a bunch of extra stuff uh, that isn't live, but it's still great content, the type of stuff you might normally see if you were at the annual family cafe in person. Uh, just yesterday, we posted a reading from one of our book fair authors. We got a, several different entertainment videos. Um, we have some Zumba stuff. We have some yoga stuff. So going forward, we're gonna have at least one of those up there on Facebook every day just to give you a little bit extra. So that's it from here at the Family Cafe. Thanks everybody again for tuning in and for being part of the 22nd Annual Family Cafe. We can't wait to see you again tomorrow morning at 11 o'clock. So until then, have a good night. Thanks everybody. Thank you.